Dobri Zin, my name is Stark, and welcome to another video on the Rusin project. Today's video is somewhat special as it is the first collaboration, in a sense, between the Society for Rusin Evolution and the Rusin project. I recently gave this speech on the history of Rusin er erasure and world politics to the SRE forum that we just had, I'd say about a week ago at the time of this recording. And due to the feedback that I got, it was overwhelmingly positive, I thought it was important to show this to a wider audience, just the small amount of people that we usually bring in to the forum. Mind you, it's usually between, let's say, 8 to 15 people. However, if I release something like this, you know, hundreds, maybe even thousands, depending on if it gets popular, We'll view this and get some valuable information. So what I'm going to be covering today is, of course, Ruth and Erasure, what it is, how it fundamentally works, but then also topics around it in terms of the structural problems face, obstacles that stop us from achieving the greatest version of ourselves. So that will all be in store. It will be a longer video today. I think somewhere between a half hour to an hour. So buckle up and get started. So, Rusin erasure. What is it generally? Well, Rusin erasure refers to a process, action, or tendency that results in Rusins being misrepresented, delegitimized, or appropriated. Now, this sounds like a lot. And it could mean many different things, especially if, if you just kind of read this definition and have no context to, to Rusin Erasure. But rest assured, I will have many examples throughout this presentation so that you better understand what I'm talking about and the validity to it in terms of our experience as a national. So to give the best background, on Rusin erasure and give a kind of full presentation and, and help you understand the greater historical context, we have to start back at the beginning, or at least how I would define the beginning of Rusin erasure. And to me, this really starts in 1867. And that is, of course, when uh, Austria and Hungary become Austria hung to the dual monarchy. And it it, it begins a process of roughly, I think, 155 years now of constant attempts from other national groups to just a constant stream of, of, of attempts to delegitimize us, steal our historical figures, our history, but most of all, assimilate us into their national group. So the first one in... I, th I think this is probably the least damaging now, looking back on it, but it was serious at the time, is modernization. And this was a essentially a policy by the central government of Hungary to assimilate its national minorities. Now, we can choose 1867 because this is when a lot of governmental policies are instituted. However, various figures saw problems or what would become problems later on. One person in one person in our case is actually Alexander Duknovich, who he had begun his activist and cultural activities in the fifties and sixties, or shall we say not exactly sixties when he died quite early, but um at least in the forties and fifties, this is when Duknovich not only begins to realize and see that he's part of this national minority, and he would have, he would have seen us as a branch of Russians back then, but he begins to see the work that, that, that needs to be done to keep our identity and culture afloat. But he also sees the problem that will come with a Hungarian nationalism. That of, of course, if we look back in history, we can see that the Hungarians, for we, we can say le legitimate reasons, revolted in 1848. 
against the Habsburg. And we can see with this too, just as, as a side note, the Russian Empire and their armies come and help crush the Hungarian revolt, their desire to have an, have an independent state again. This event was actually important for Rusyns because when the Russian army marched through the Carpathians into Hungary proper, the Pannonian Plain, it led to a great number of Rusyns developing a national consciousness. It was almost as if this spectacle, seeing these Russian soldiers, was was almost what they needed to kind of recognize that yeah, they were different from Hungarians or or, or any other minority. So we'll we'll put a pin in that. That's not exactly important to this presentation, but just know that Duknovich and others were conscious of the problem that would come with a, a rising Hungarian nationalism decades before. It's just in 1867 is when it officially starts. So, aside from Hungarian nationalism, why would the Hungarians want to do this? Why would they institute policies of, of only teaching Hungarian in schools? Why would they make it easy for people to change their names into, or ch ch change their surname into a, a Hungarian one? Or why would they do that on purpose? Or rather... Why would they begin to try to steal national figures of other minorities and try to incorporate them into some type of Hungarian lineage? Well, we can see that this really rests in the historical troubles that Hungarians have had encountered. And what I mean by that is the Hungarians were not a large majority of their own state. As you can see by this image here, which I think describes it quite well, they essentially owned the Pannonian Plain, their small area, the Eastern Carpathians. However, the minority groups were vast and plentiful in their native areas. For example, the Rusins, the Slovaks, the Croats, the Romanians, and while this was always going to be somewhat of the case, given given the borders that Hungary had set for itself, that that had been, you know, static for centuries, part of the reason of why this occurred and why Hungarians were really not a huge percentage of the population was because centuries earlier, when the Ottomans invaded and the Hungarians went to war with the Ottomans, this led to a a great depopulation of Lower Hungary. This was in what we would now know as areas like Vojvodina, areas of eastern Croatia, western Romania. These areas had been populated by Hungarians, and they had received the brunt of this depopulation mass killings. And when Hungary gets these lands back, number one, they first try to have Germans and Hungarians move into these regions, which... Some of them do. However, a large percentage of people that would move south would be Slovaks, Rusyns, Romanians. And many of them still keep this distinct identity to this day. And furthermore, the Slovaks, the Rusyns, these people did not really receive uh, any great trauma from the Ottoman invasions. They were never conquered and ruled over. Most of the fighting was well south of them. And so you have this kind of issue where suddenly Hungarians make up a great deal less of, of their country. So we can see why the Hungarians did this. But of course, it led uh, in, in a big way to their own destruction. Because through the process of modernization, um, especially the Ruthenians, or Rusins, shall we say. I was just reading off the picture. The, these different minorities, by, by the time that World War I comes around and then eventually, you know, the breakup of Austria-Hungary, none of them wanted to become a part of Hungary or become part of a new Hungary. They all wanted to try their own national projects, and th this may have happened anyways, but the effect of modernization really forced the issue. 
and it made it very clear that there was no way that they were that all these minorities were going to fit within a greater Hungary. So the effect that it had on Rusins specifically was that many emigrated and permanently so, but also we see a, a type of general suppression of Rusin identity throughout this time. And we, you know, we, we can only really speculate, but from the research that I've seen, certainly within the tens of thousands were assimilated into becoming Hungarians. Whether this would be, they, they would move into Hungary proper, or just associate themselves as Hungarians in their native villages. Regardless, we're talking about on a scale that was, a, you know, a, a good percentage of the Rusin population. Nothing like 50%, but um, it, it certainly did not help Rusin's surviving. In but I would say the first extreme example of Rusin erasure was the Austrian during the time of World War I. Apologies for the graphic picture, but I think it's important for people to realize. The Austrian policy of Rusin erasure really pertained to Lemko. And because Lemko was in also Galician Russophiles, uh, Eastern Galicia, which was also part of Austria-Hungary, because these people were pro-Russian, or at least had a had Russophilia, um, Russophilic tendencies, they were seen as potential columns by the state. Now, what exactly does Austria do with this situation? Well, they go about and picking through the intelligentsia of Lemkovina of Galicia. And they actually put them into the first concentration camp ever in Europe, Tallerhof, in Austria proper. And the horrid conditions that people would encounter, uh, you know, there was a four volume work accounting all the different um, cases that, that had happened within this concentration camp, uh, all, all, all the various stories, people sleeping outside without any clothes for days at a time. It's really horrible things. And so they take the thought leaders of the Lemka Rusins of the Galician Russophiles. You know, they exile them from their homelands, kill many of them, starve them. But they also institute a policy of Ukrainianization. And essentially, from the Austrian perspective, Ukrainian identity was less of an issue to them than was a Russian one, or at least a Russophile tendency. And so while native Lemko Rusin organizations and clubs and other such things were most of the time banned, but often suppressed and various but also I would say to rephrase that, they were often banned um but or, but in some cases, just merely suppressed, the, the Ukrainian organizations were allowed to operate freely, or at least to a much greater degree than the Rusnophile and Russophile ones. And so we see a tendency to have the Ukrainophiles, because they can be public, because they can you know, feel as though the state won't come down on them hard, they they begin to influence the local populations to a great degree. And in Galicia, the battle between the Rusnophiles or the old Ruthenians, uh, the Russophiles and the Ukrainophiles, this is eventually won out by the Ukrainians. And it's not successful in Lemkovena. However, it does make a problem in eastern Lemkovena where a great deal of the population begins to believe that they are Ukrainians, especially the more close, close by the eastern Galician border. And this is a problem that we still encounter today, and it's this real difference, um, the, the, this real difference between the Ukrainophile Lemkos and the Rusnophile Lemkos. It, it, it really originates from this time. And so 
regardless of, uh, of, of, of all these other factors, we also see, besides Tellerhoff, besides Ukraine, Ukraine feel as, um, the promotion of Ukrainian identity. There, there's also a policy of essentially doing whatever you want to Lemko villages whether this be mass murders, hangings, essentially convictions without any due process. It is vast, and it really delegitimizes Rusins as a people. We are seen almost as subhuman, and it is allowed for other groups that are foreign to us to come in and attempt to assimilate us. So th this was a very extreme period in Rusin history, and it provided the first real encounter with what could happen at an industrial scale uh, to a minority. Uh, it, it provided a, a, shall we say, example for what would happen in the future. It was kind of a warning to some extent that we didn't necessarily listen to. Of course, after World War One. we have the Lemka Rusin Republic that wished to join with the Koyashi Rus. However, that was rejected. And so the first major act, major act of Rusin sovereignty fizzled out. So we can see that this was, you know, a troubling time. But what is even worse to some degree was the decades of silence. And the decades of silence was a period of complete Rusin. And this was the period between 1945 and 1991, or essentially when Rusins were under communist rule, where Rusin identity was completely outlawed. You were not able to identify as a Rusin in any documents. You had to, and, and this is actually a true story for many that were born and lived in Slovakia, you had to choose between identifying as Ukrainian or Slovak on, on your documents. And, and this meant that if you chose Ukrainian, you would go to a Ukrainian school. If you went to, if you chose Slovak, you would go to a Slovak school. And not just this, but there was mass policies against Rusins, um, especially those who stood up against communists. The picture you see here, actually, is of Blaziv. This is in eastern Slovakia. And this village, along with a, a few other minor places, was destroyed officially to build a military base. But in reality, they were heavily anti-communist. Uh, they were against having a, a Ukrainian school, which was built in the 1950s for the town. Uh, they were against that. And generally speaking, they were a nuisance for the Czechoslovak communist government. So what did they do? Well, they raised it to the ground. Essentially nothing is left today. So it was truly one of the most horrific times that Russians have ever experienced. Whereas World War I was certainly traumatizing in its own way. This was a whole nother ballgame because it lasted for... Let's see here. I mean, 45, uh, let's see here, 40, 40, 46 years. So it's it's something in, in which we still have not fully recovered from to this day. And it was started, I think, illegitimately by the annexation of Subcarpathian routes to Soviet Ukraine. But that's a whole nother story. However, Many of the same tactics and policies that was carried out by the Soviet Union against Rusins still remains in Ukraine today. So there is a type of continuation, a type of a type of um, handing over ha handing the torch over to the Ukrainian government in regards to policy. Rusins. So also during this time that I think it's important to note that people should phrased differently than what they've done now is the Lemko ethnocide. Now, most people say Axia Viswa. I would argue that Axia Viswa does not do 
justice to what actually happened. It was not a mere operation. It was the extermination of Lemko culture, of Lemko Vina as an ethnographical area. And not just this, it was assisted by, for example, Czechoslovakia through the closing of borders. So, for example, Lemko Rusins who tried to flee the Polish authorities, because, of course, they don't want to be sent halfway across the country to, to the recovered territories. That's now by Germany. They don't want that. So they attempt to cross in, and most people get stopped by the Czechoslovak army. They are not allowed to flee into fellow Rusin lands. And not just this, churches are stolen and converted into Roman Catholic churches, and homes in other, you know, higher villages, frankly, would become Polish ones if they weren't turned to rubble. So, this Lemko ethnocide is really a perfect example of historical Rusin erasure because essentially you delegitimize us as, as unique people. You appropriate our historical churches, you, you know, the church, our land, and it becomes a situation where one of the major Rusin regions is just simply lost history. And we'll talk about what to do about this in a later video. However, it's something that people saying eat Axia Viswa, this does not connote, um, um, I shouldn't say connote, um, oh, sorry guys, it's like one in the morning when I'm trying to record this. It does not exactly portray the events to the, to the greatest severity, or at least to, to the true severity of the crimes that were that, that were committed so i think when we talk about historical reasons these are all important however let's shift now to primary avenues of russia today well we can divide define these more clearly and, and i think this will really help you understand what russian erasure means in a modern context. well of course it means propaganda that defines russians as agents of russia or hungry. This delegitimizes us because it is as if we are not an autonomous people. We do not lack agency. We are merely the invention of somebody else. And also in regards to um, another one is producing fake statistics to back up delegitimization of opinions. Now, I will have actually a very good example of this in the next slide, but we can talk about census, you know, in inaccurate on purpose census results, um, trying to portray Rusins as less religious or less ethnically conscious. Um, very common thing that we still have to worry about, even in the modern day. Claiming that ethnic Rusins and their work are actually the product of a different people. Bad research driven by money or ideology. Statements that Rusins do not speak right or are speaking a bad dialect of Ukrainian. Now, what exactly can we say about these? Or how should we look at this? And what kind of examples can be given to illustrate this? Well, I have some good ones in store for you. We can take a look at the census in Zakarpatia or Subcarpathia, Podkarpatsko Rus, if you want to use the Rusin term for it, we can see that essentially it is claimed that Rusins are only 0.8% of the entire population in the Carpathia. We of course know this isn't true, however it is used on the internet by some officials and essentially is a way to discredit Rusins as, you know, nationally conscious in this region. And it's just, it's it's frankly baffling that so many researchers that I've seen, you know, mistake this as legitimate, uh, but, but it, it happens. I even had, for example, a, a researcher from a anti-genocide NGO or whatever type of organization, or if it was a, you know, 
they use this statistic to back up their argument that, well, it's most likely that Rusins are just a Russian boy that, uh, you know, it's, it, it's really nothing there to take a look at. So this happens even with researchers. So it's, it's a systemic problem. Um, appropriation of historical figures. And, and, and I think this is huge. And I think this will become more of a problem in the future. We can see um, Alexander uh, Sherba, Sherba. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. However, take that for what you will. He is someone who works with a actual government institution in Kiev. He is a Ukrainian government official. I believe he works for the for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for Ukraine. You know, this is obviously some type of propaganda post, but he goes on to say that Kiev is renaming Dostoevsky straight to Andy Warhol. And then he adds, to understand the context, Warhol's family comes from West Ukraine. Well, of course, neither of the, you know, this is not true. And the fact that they are assigning straight to Andy Warhol as if to mean that he is ethnically Ukrainian they were wrong on both counts. He's he was not ethnically Ukrainian, and his family did not come from Ukraine. Number one, Andy Warhol was Rusin, and his family came from Priyashivska Rus or East Slovakia. So you can see that. I mean, this is just the you know the the clearest example of appropriation of Rusin culture and history. Uh, and this is the best example I have ever seen, and. It really goes to show you the depths that even government officials will go to somehow legitimize um, their 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 rule over our history, our culture, our nation. And so, just remember that this uh, this appropriation, just general roots and erasure. It's not just from people online. It is from literal governments and government officials. So the problem is really something that that goes into the deepest level of politics and any arena that Rusins have to play in. Now, when we talk about agents of foreign states, of course, the guy in this image is not particularly important. He has his own baggage. However, notice how often in photos of Rusins that are arrested, they will purposely put the Rusin flag in the background just like this. And they will purposely try to portray Rusins um, and Rusin imagery in the worst way possible. And so this just further goes to show that, hey, you know, we cannot, it's not simply that we are just or suppressed and that you will deny us being a different people but you also claim that we are agents of foreign states right um and in particular this whole kind of delegitimization and kind of um lacking agency they're specifically trying to associate rusin uh, rusin images rusin flag you know our flag our our uh, emblem they're trying to make it um People react in a negative way to it when they see it, as if to say, "Oh my gosh, that is a separatist thing," or "Oh, that's something that that was created in Moscow." They're purposely trying to take our symbols and warp them. So, of course, bad research. We can talk more about this for you know another hour. However, just know that this article has also been used by various people from NGOs and other agencies that I've talked to as a type of, as, as you know, they've used this article to somehow uh, legitimize the thought that Andy Warhol was Ukrainian. And in particular, this piece, and it's so common with bad research on Rusins, is that they will, if they do not outright frame people as Ukrainians, they will say that the Rusins are just merely um, unnationalized Ukrainians. That, oh, they, they, they say that they're Ruthenian or Rusin, but 
at, at the end of the day, they just did not become aware of the Ukrainianness. So, but really, they are Ukrainian. Very common action, and um, something that I don't see slowing down from. Another topic, or shall we say connected topic, to Bruce and Erasure is structural oppression. Now, I know for the American viewers, depending on your political leanings, you can either be really interested in this or scoff at it. However, just take the time to listen for a moment. Bruce and oppression, or structural oppression for Bruce can really be divided or is made up of two separate things. First is institutional oppression. This develops from actions or policies put in place at the institutional level. So for example, Rusins cannot have their issues represented in national politics because they are not officially recognized as a national minority and subject to forms of erasure. Now for social oppression, we can think of this as for example, the, the resulting disadvantages manifested through beliefs and actions at the level of social interaction. So if it is inappropriate to speak Rusin in work settings um, because people have a negative attitude towards Rusin dialects and Carpathia, for example, you're not speaking right, why aren't you speaking the standard Ukrainian? Um, why, why, you know, why are you speaking this weird, with this weird accent in, in, in dialect? This is a social oppression because it is not just something of, oh, well, you know, something of lower class. We speak a different language. So, of course, people not, who do not know Rusin uh, will not understand it. And this is something that people really suffer from because for many Rusins, especially in Subcarpathia, Rusin is their native language. They have to go learn Ukrainian at school. And if they can't even in their native region how to speak in Rusin at, at, at work, it is a type of social oppression. And structural oppression, if we look at it in a Rusin context, is really the combination and the interaction um, of these policies and practices between institutions and social environments. So if you want to give a very clear definition of structural oppression, you can say, for example, the environment that Rusins live in within the state of Ukraine. It is the entire environment that Rusins live in, which we can define as structural oppression. Now, the difference between Rusin erasure and Rusin oppression is that Rusin erasure is the actions and processes that create or are manifested by an oppressive environment. So, for example, Rusin erasure, a, a specific process, like, for example, modernization, this is a process of erasing Rusin identity of delegitimizing Rusin ness, Rusin culture, the Rusin language. Through this process, there is a development of institutional and social oppression, which then lead to an overall structural oppression of the Rusin people. So it's very important to understand the difference between these two because they're both incredibly important to really grasping the situation that we are currently in and that we have historically been in and why we are like how we are today. Why, for example, so many Rusins in the world don't know that they're Rusin? Because guess what? Rusin erasure occurred in the diaspora and the homeland. It wasn't specific to, you know, a certain people in a certain region. It was systemic across anywhere that Rusin. So just keep that in mind. As you go forward, and if you're a Russian activist, keep these ideas in mind as you as you create your and recognize that this is this problem that we have is actually rather you that Russian erasure and the type of Russian oppression has been enforced on us by pretty much every other people that we lived with. Now what is the importance of, I've, I kind of already framed this for you, but the, the true importance of understanding Rusin erasure, structural oppression in the Rusin context is because we lack a systematic way of identifying and counteracting Rusin erasure in the world. The fact that we are incapable at this time 
to be cognizant of it and to attack it is the reason why it has occurred so much and continues to be a problem today. Now, what exactly can we do about this issue? What exactly can we do to, number one, raise the consciousness of people, but then also what can we do to combat this? Well, think about it like this. There's roughly five different ways. You can add a couple more depending on your situation, but in essence, you, you, you can do these things. Of course, the first thing is actually pop popularizing the words Rusin erasure and Rusin oppression. Number one, by using it directly in instances of it occurring, whether it be you know people actually acting out Rusin erasure and then you calling them out on that when other Rusins are around or just simply so that the person knows that you know what they're doing. And also by creating your own content on the topic, by confronting it and then creating your own content. Um, it is, or shall we say, because, because that's going to be the next one, um, by actually labeling what examples of Rusin erasure and also by creating own content in terms of popularizing it, you can help people become cognizant of it very quickly, especially if you go on places like TikTok, YouTube Shorts, Instagram, just making short videos or just simply saying, hey, this is an example of, of Rusin erasure, that can very quickly hit a large amount of people and straight up incorporate the, these terms and these, these ideas, frankly, uh, into their into their Now, you, what you can also do to, to combat this that isn't about necessarily helping other Rusins is by criticizing, you know, by by stating how this is, is a direct contradiction to the principles of European values. This is specifically in the case of European Rusins, those that live in the homeland. Um, as we know that this, 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 this idea of European values, at least the idea of trying to adhere to it, is incredibly strong, um, especially in, shall we say, more upper class environments. So by going for the throat with this move, uh, you are putting these people on the defensive, not only because you're calling them out, but also you're hitting at a fundamental thing that they're contradicting. So a very valuable method. Make note of the shared responsibility that each person and nation has regarding this problem. This is, in a sense, attempting to, number one, enforce what I just talked about um, in terms of the direct contradiction to the principles of European values, but also in a way of, of, of trying to gain allies from their peoples, trying to be able to have people from other cultures who are sympathetic to our cause understand what they also need to do. Because ending Rusin erasure and ending the structures of oppression we face will not simply come from Rusins alone needs to come from us primarily, but we also need a network of allies that are willing to help advertise our, our message, help trying to change their own culture so that it stops occurring. It takes both us and allies to do this. Of course, another thing you can do is call out other Rusin leaders who are unwilling to challenge Rusin erasure. We all know how common this is. I'm not going to go into um, make a spectacle of the of specific people and of specific instances. However, I think we all know that many Russian leaders lack a sense of a backbone, or not just a sense of it. They completely lack a backbone, or it is not in their own interests to confront Russian erasure or really advocate for our people in general. And the question becomes, well, what are you doing? Uh, what are, are, are you doing leading us? And how can we expect average people to do this if our leaders won't? And of course, if you're a more traditional activist, you can always organize on the local level to deal with systematic prob systemic problems that exist in your environment. This is particularly 
needed Ethia, but then in also even for example regions in the diaspora where people so many people believe that they're Slovaks or there's so many different Slovak organizations, Russian organizations that make it a point to try to assimilate Rusins and the descendants of, of Rusin immigrants into their own culture, their own nation. We need to begin pushing back against that. And we need to make it very clear that, yeah, sure, there are Rusins that live in Slovakia. However, that does not mean they're inherently a part of your Slovak heritage. Um, they don't need to inherently be part of your club, of your string of organizations. That is not exactly needed because, of course, we are our own unique and autonomous people. And so these are just some examples, and I will work through this more in a book that I'll be releasing uh, in the beginning of August. It will cover many of these issues, but then also a number of other things. So there will be plenty of new content, regardless of how many of these instructional videos I release. But that pretty much wraps it up for today. If you're interested in debating these topics, if you're interested in learning more, uh, we'll be covering internalized subjugation, uh, specific examples of Rusin erasure, uh, and how we can combat them, for example, like a type of workshop where where, where we try to work through it and, um, and then actually put something into action, practicing combating Rusin erasure. But regardless, we will be having another one of those sessions next week. And the SRE forum goes every two weeks. So it is twice a month. And then in the weeks in between, I do the live stream. So if you if you want to attend the forum, we would love to have you. Um, but if not, um, and you just are very interested in these topics, please let me know in the comments below. And I will continue to post these. And that's all. Have a great day.